Go ahead. Okay, so uh, we have coming up next um, Embry Riddle, uh, and this is uh, ERAU's National Eclipse Project uh, Angler to Total Eclipse. And with that, I will turn it over to you guys um, for your presentation. All righty, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Samira Lees. We're from Ember Riddle, and we are the northern team for the Arizona Eclipse Project. So, let's see if I can. Let's me. There we go. Um, there are a lot of us on our team. Um, I'm one of the team leads. So I'm Samira Lees, and Mackenzie can introduce herself. All right, yeah, I don't know if she's on, but then we have uh, Zach Howe, Benjamin Canuel, Kyle Claire, Evan Highland, Calvin Lindman, Renona Ralston, Chloe Reed, Santiago Nuno, and then Kevin Zamora. And then we do have a lot more students on our team, but these are those who are mostly prevalent. So here is a mission overview. So we are just trying to collect atmospheric data and see what the conditions of the atmosphere have on our everyday electronics during the annular and total eclipse. So we are the engineering projects instead of the atmospheric uh, balloons. So we're gonna go over a quick ground station overview and we're gonna go through the setup. So we have our team here, and then we have computer set up. So we are actually collecting data from the payloads that are being sent via packets through an RFD 900 and our ubiquity radio system, which is those nice big dishes that you see over there. We actually had them staggered because we were having issues with getting a lock on our payloads. And we believe that it was either from the RVs that were at the park or um, just regular us just being next to each other. And based on what we had tested after the eclipse is, was probably just the RVs just in the park causing disturbances because the radio waves were not going all the way through. And then as you see on the bottom is how we can connect to the RFD 900. So now we'll just go into a quick payload overview. So, this is our Pi camera payload. So basically we have um, Pies, so the Raspberry Pies inside and we can connect to these little cameras. And through these cameras, we were able actually to record most of the eclipse. Um, but what we realized is that um, we did not put any kind of solar film over our thing. So when we were recording the video, you can see that the sun is just really, really bright. But we do this normally through uh, something called Ascend. And we realize that the video is a lot brighter than it would have been otherwise. So that was something cool to see. And that hopefully during the total eclipse, we can hopefully put like a solar film and be able to actually catch some of like the cool like pictures that we got on our phone. But here's a good video. We were able to catch until burst. So that's when the balloon pops. Um, and you can see all like the payloads flying down. It is a very shaky, spinny video. So I decided not to include it. So no one got too dizzy. But here are some images that we captured. So we had two cameras and we are planning on moving forward and adding two more cameras so we can get the full thing just in case we like missed something during the total eclipse. So, and then we have the Iridium. So the Iridium is basically how we are able to move the ground station and track where our payloads are going. So we have the Ubiquity dish and then the ground station and the payload. So what these do is they all talk to each other and they help each other track in a, a appropriate way for it to go through and see what's going on. And this is where we were having some issues. And this is what we believe was through the RV park and that we were not really getting the full connection. So hopefully during this next eclipse, we can be a bit more in the open range, not have too many vehicles around. So we didn't get any uh, electronic disturbances from the cars or whatnot. And then we have the pterodactyl board. Um, 
and I forgot to mention this in our quick little overview, but um, from us having some fun with the Eclipse, um, we have named all of our payloads based off of the Scooby-Doo gang. So the pie cameras were Fred, the Iridium was Scooby-Doo, and then this is Velma. So it was just a fun way for us to add like our little touch on some of our payloads. So here's our payload and here's the board. So this collects our like GPS lock, RMU data, and other atmospheric sensor data. And then we have a teensy on there just to collect data as well. So this one was also pretty exciting data to see, but we were not able to make it look visually appealing enough. But through the GPS lock, we were able to actually see when bursts happens. So then when we looked at the graph, it would go up and then it'll shake a little bit and then it'll drop back down, go back up and then it'll fall back and then it just cuts out. So that's how we know when burst happens because during our regular research meetings, we were able to actually see that on our own payloads. So we were able to identify when burst happens and whatnot. And we were actually climbing pretty quickly. And then now is for the R D900, this one we called Shaggy. Um, so we were actually getting packet data consistently up until, I'm trying to remember, I think it was like an hour in because I think we just got too far and whatnot. So this semester, we're actually gonna try to rewrite the software and see if there are ways that we can make this uh, packet data more readable. So what happens is that the RFD 900 inside the payload is talking to the RFD 900 on the ground and it sends like data in what we call packets. So through these packets, we're actually able to get all this data that you see on the left hand side. So it was pretty good to see that we were getting consistent data, but at some point it just kind of stopped and we were trying our hardest to refix it. So I think through our test launches for this semester, we're going to see what we can do to keep it consistent and also just have it be readable because we were seeing the packets, but it's not in this like pretty format that you see here. It was in like messy strings of numbers. So we're trying to find a better way to do that. And then this is Sinella, and then I can let Mackenzie take this over. She put in the chat that she's having technical difficulties. So if she doesn't come on, you might have to cover for her. All righty. So basically this is uh, Sinella. So we are now calling this one also Daphne. So basically this is collecting our similar atmospheric data, but this is one of our separate uh, payloads from what Montana provided. So we're actually just trying to go through like the IMU, the GPS, um, a UV sensor and whatnot. And this is just to find ways that while we're recording the eclipse, if any of these sensors also have an effect on like, the Raspberry Pi and whatnot. And yeah. And then here is another one of our own experiments. This is a sound experiment. So basically what we're trying to do with this payload is we're trying to go through the very low frequency or VLF radio. So VLF radio can help actually track emissions and whatnot through like the natural earth atmosphere. And yeah, so this one is thought up by one of our alumni and he actually taught us how uh, very low frequency works. So as you can see on the right hand side is the data we collected during one of our practice launches. So as you can see, there is a little bit of a, uh, I don't know how I, if I can do, oh, laser pointer, here we go. So this area right here, throughout the entire flight, there was a repeated signal. So we realized that through this, we can actually um, see that the iridium is trying to lock onto the ground. So this is just the repeated signal that we kept getting. So it was pretty cool to see that we can actually hear when uh, the payloads were trying to connect. And I would have played the sound for you also, but it's a lot of whooshing sounds and very squeaky of the foam rubbing against each other. But 
yeah, that was our experiment. So now we're excited to go on to this semester and see what we have in store. But I'd like to give a quick thank you to our mentors, Dr. Liao, Professor Wesson, and then Arizona News for Research, uh, Arizona Space Grant, and then our undergraduate research institution, and Dr. Betcher and Dr. Bryan. All right. Thank you so much. And again, perfectly timed. So uh, <laughs> any questions? Uh, not a question, but um, Randy put in the chat uh, just a comment in here that he said that if the RVs have radios on the exact same frequency, it may be a possibility, or if the RVs are in the direct line mm -hmm. of sight of the balloon, and signal will be degraded as well, too. So just a comment from Randy uh, from Montana State. So, All right. Thank you for that. We actually right. would keep that in mind. I have a question, actually. Um, in mm -hmm. the photo you called the setup photo, there were three antennas in view, and they weren't pointing in the same direction. And I'm just wondering, was that really during a flight, or were you pointing at three different things? So what we were actually trying to do, this was during the, this was during our setup, like actively, like it's we're about to like start launching. I for whatever reason we could not get a lock on our payload so we went to our ground station and we were locking it there and then walking all the way back to our launch site it was just probably like a couple like meters away but we were just trying to find a way for them to start locking so when they lock they kind of just do their own thing and we were just seeing with the rfd if we pointed them in different directions if us individually can get our lock because we have uh two balloons so it's northern and uh southern of arizona so but the southern arizona they're actually presenting later today which is asu u of a and i think cast and grand so we were just trying to see what was happening because for whatever reason we were having issues just connecting initially but once we got into the air we were able to connect and then we got far enough and then just it stopped connecting okay thank you mm -hmm. One thing I'll I'll note with that just um, as well is that uh, even though those use spread spectrum technologies for those um, who, ubiquities and stuff like that, um, interference is still possible. Uh, one of the things I guess we didn't really try even with our setup at Iowa State as well is um, you can manually set what the channel are for those. Uh, you may, if you have two that are really close to each other, I'd probably shift one to a different bank of channels the other one on the on the farther side of the spectrum, just to avoid um, any potential interference between the two as well. Um, that'd be something else you could try for next time as well. So definitely, thank you so much. Okay. Yep. Any other questions? If not, again, we'll give you a big round of virtual applause and thank you so much. Um, if you don't mind, stop sharing.